Hey guys, John Paulamy here, Actionable Intelligence. Today's Sunday, June 21st, 2020. It's the weekly market update. So, the first thing I wanted to talk about was an article I read on the Acting Man website, link in the show notes. And I thought it was pretty good because it talked about something I've been talking about too. I use the term um, crossing the Rubicon to describe the unprecedented amount of Federal Reserve monetary creation and government insertion of itself into the economy post the COVID-19 crisis. But this is not anything new just with respect to the recent crisis. We've had monetary malfeasance going on since we came off the gold standard in 1971. And we've had government intervention in the economy for almost 100 years, excessive amounts in my view. But what I want to look at and show from the article was the this graph, which I thought was excellent, and kind of illustrates things. Here on the left is the total amount of Fed assets. What are Fed assets? You know, they buy mortgage-backed securities, they buy treasury bills, treasury bonds, they buy government debt from the treasury, create currency units, dollars, if you will, out of thin air, and then buy these government securities. The government, U.S. government, then uses this cash to conduct its business. You'll note that um, the end of the quantitative tightening experience after the unprecedented amount of monetary creations from the 2008 financial crisis, which got us to the Fed's balance sheet of being over $4 trillion. They went through a period, if you recall, the Federal Reserve, that is, of trying to do quantitative tightening. We had the repo crisis late last year in the fall, if you recall. Monetary spigot was turned back on, and then... We've went parabolic, if you will, um, since the COVID crisis, as we've had million, tens of millions of people unemployed. Well, you know the story. We've been over it. And I just think this rocket ship is interesting. You know, the Fed balance sheet, of as of June 23rd, or June 3rd, this is just a couple weeks ago, is over $7 trillion. A couple of quotes from the article, which I said I'll link to, I thought were great. So it started out with Jay Powell planting a happy little money tree in 2019 to keep the repo market from suffering, suffering a terminal seizure. This essentially led to a restoration of the status quo anti-QT, the mythical beast known as quantitative tightening that was briefly glimpsed in 2018 and 2019. Thus, the Roach Motel theory of QE was concerned, confirmed. Once a central bank resorts to quantitative easing, a return to standard monetary policy becomes impossible. You can check in, but you can never leave. Or as the old Roach Motel advertisements, roaches check in, but they can't check out. And this is what I've been arguing for years on my blog and since I've had this video channel. When you get into the situation and when the decision is made and for short-term political reasons to enter into government monetization of debt in order to, for whatever reason, that's justified at the moment, you will end a never-ending cycle of continuing to have to insert yourself into the economy after every crisis and print and create larger and larger and larger amounts of currency units to try to fix the uh, damage that was done uh, from previous interventions. And I don't think a lot of people get this. What's curious is, is I'm reading, currently reading, the Stephanie Kelton book, Stephanie Kelton, the professor that has been, was Bernie Sanders' chief economist for his campaign, and she spent time on Capitol Hill. She's a big advocate of MMT, modern monetary theory, and I think it's important to talk about what's happening because monet modern monetary theory is coming down the pipeline whether people like it or not. So you're seeing that there's nobody, I guess what I'm, the point I'm making is no one's standing in the way of any of this and saying, hey, this is not going to end well. And it's like I said before, it doesn't matter 
what I think personally of the policies or whether I think they're going to work or not work. It matters to kind of understand where the policies are going, what they are, where they're going, and then what are the possible ramifications of that such that we can position ourselves to take advantage because a lot of people are going to be hurt by this, in my view at least, and many others. Um, I'm not going to get into the deficit myth book that I'm reading. Uh, we'll get into that in a subsequent video that I'll put out after I finish reading the book. However, uh, I will say that that's where I think you know both parties are aligned. We're just printing money. They're coming up with new programs. There's now a uh, $1 trillion plus infrastructure bill in Congress that's going to evidently be passed. Uh, I guess that will just be monetized also. And we're turning Japanese in uh, you know, the Japanese have been, you know, basically monetizing their government debt for years and years and years. And the thinking is, is that, you know, we can go there because there's never, there's not been any inflation. That's really what it is. You know, a, a sovereign issuer of its own currency um, can continue, can never go bankrupt because it can issue its own currency as long as inflation doesn't set in. The problem seems to be that people don't seem to understand is that inflation always does set in eventually and that once you start these interventions, they get bigger and bigger and bigger after every crisis. And you never get back, you never are able to get back to normal, normalization, if you will. Which brings me to another quote from the article. It's easy to see why. Any attempt to seriously reduce outstanding central bank credit will bring about the very situation QE was intended to prevent, i.e. falling asset prices and an economic bust. That's exactly right. You know, people are, people are like shocked. They're like, why is the stock market near all-time highs? Why are these tech stocks making all-time highs? Why is this happening? The economy's in the toilet because they're printing money and the money's going into the stock market. You know, people always say there's no inflation, John. Yes, there is in financial assets. You have the Federal Reserve and the Treasury have created special purpose vehicles to go in and buy corporate bonds now. That is happening. Where are they getting the money? Why are they, well, who decides which corporate bond will be bought? You know, all in the, in the misguided attempt to save the economy from itself, to correct from previous economic interventions. It's like being on an icy road. You start to slide, and instead of just letting off the gas and uh, you, you, you increase the speed and then you overcompensate the steering and your swerves get bigger and bigger until you fly off the road and go into a snowbank. Except you can get, get a tow truck and nine times out of ten you won't, you know, you're, you're none hurt. This is going to end in disaster. So seemingly no one in officialdom ever stops to ask why that should be so. Talking about the very situation that QE was intended to prevent. You know, ostensibly, the reason given is we, we, we self-inflicted this economic depression on ourselves worldwide because of the wrong data that we had. I'm not going to get into that again. I mean, people did what they th probably thought they should do. We did, They didn't look at the second-order effects. And now we got ourselves into an economic depression. We've got tens of millions of people unemployed, businesses failing. And so somebody needs to do something, right? The government's going to step up and, uh, and the Federal Reserve, and they're going to do whatever they got to do. But no one ever stops and asks why that should be. What happened to self-sustaining recoveries? Remember, we were just going to increase the balance sheet after 2008. We were just going to print enough money until we got a self-sustaining recovery, and we would achieve escape velocity. Could it be the economy is neither a, this is a Latin word, they like to use Latin on this website, uh, basically a perpetual motion machine or a spaceship? The economy is not a perpetual motion machine or a spaceship. Business cycles are part of the economics and economics in a capitalist system. Okay? As companies become profitable, they attract competitors if their margins are high enough. They attract competitors. Some of them fail. That means they have to be allowed to go out of business and that recycle that labor and that capital from the failures back into new generated companies or the successor companies. But trying to save everyone from themselves, now we've had decades of this. And now look where we're at. We're, we're at $7 trillion on the Fed's balance sheet and the things like a rocket ship going 
going higher. And people are saying, well, why is the stock market going up when the, when the, when the economic earnings are going to be in the toilet? Everybody kind of acknowledges that. Because you're printing money. I mean, it had record stock prices in Venezuela and Zimbabwe also because the central government, you know, took it to extremes. So let's talk about these zombie companies. Got this off the U.S. Global Investors website, Frank Holmes. I enjoy reading his Frank Talks. Uh, I would sign up for it. I would go over there. Don't necessarily agree with all of his stances, but he always puts together good chart packs and uh, keeps current with the data. But I thought this was interesting. This is the percent of U.S. zombie firms. What are we talking about that? A zombie firm, we're, we're saying that is a company whose debt and interest payments, their cash flows can't support the interest payments on their debt. Okay? So you're up to 20% of the, co- of the companies in the United States, well, virtually 20%, 18.9%, basically do not generate enough cash flow to make the debt and interest payments on the debt they hold. So basically, they, those companies, look, look what we've done. I mean, we've been able to allow them to, to borrow money to stay alive. That's virtually what they've done. And now, instead of letting these companies fail, which, you know, that would be politically unpalatable in an election year because of the self-induced COVID crisis, you're not going to let 20% of the companies fail with the ensuing unemployment and economic dislocations to the banks and everything else. So the government... The Treasury, in, in violation of U.S. law and the mandate of the Federal Reserve, are in cahoots to set up special purpose vehicles and are now in the bond market buying these bonds. Remember, if you've been a follower of my channel for since the inception, one of the, one of the things I thought was going to kick the economic crisis off was not COVID. I thought it would be the implosion of these zombie companies led by a lot of the shale companies when the shale miracle burst. We, I've been talking about this, but, you know, and we, we saw that at the beginning of this crisis until, until the Fed and the Treasury announced that they were going to set up the special purpose vehicles and go in and buy the zombie companies. Then the high-yield bond funds, the junk bond funds, rallied on that news as all the Sharpies in Wall Street front-ran and bought all of it, bought all those bonds before the Federal Reserve set up their their tool with the Treasury to go in and buy it. See how it works? That's why you have a wealth inequality gap. That's that's a reason right there. It's rigged. If you knew, what what would you do if you went to Hialeah to the horse races and you knew in advance which horse was going to win? Okay, wouldn't you get your bets in before the hoi polloi, before the public got in? If you knew the 50 to 1 long shot was going to win, you put a lot of money in it. The odds would come down. It would attract more money. You know, if the Federal Reserve and Treasury are going to make these announcements months in advance of when they do it, of course the Sharpies on Wall Street and in the banks and in the hedge funds are going to go buy these things. And then they're going to get bought by the Federal Reserve. Guaranteed money. You get your bonus. Wealth inequality continues. What about the schlubs? You know, I, I own part of an ice cream store in Venice Beach. You got hobos and bums living there. You can't open a store. The government won't let us, and there's no relief. Our sales are down 60%. This is our main time here. No one's helping us. What about the people that are listening to this, and you've been kicked, on your, kicked out of your job? You have no prospects, or you're running a business. No one's bailing you out. No one's allowing you to front-run the money. Spigot, $7 trillion. Let's look at it. Besides the $600 welfare check you guys got, or whatever $1,200 welfare check, depending on your situation, did you see any of this $4 trillion? Well, the Sharpies have seen it. No, I'm not a class warrior. I'm just telling you. That's how it is. I'm not running for office. I'm not a democratic socialist. But I am against crony capitalism, which has been going on. And this is a perfect example. This problem, these, these companies should be able to fail and be liquidated. In the long run, that would be better for everybody. But we're not going to do it. Returning Japanese, that's what they do in Japan. They have tons of zombie companies. The government just bails them out. They just plot along. There's no innovation. It's hard to, you know, entrepreneurship goes away. Everything becomes static, fossilized. That's not capitalism. But hey... We're told 
took this uh, screenshot from CNBC. Jay Powell, your Federal Reserve Chairman, Fed will act forcefully, proactively, and aggressively. Well, they damn sure did that, didn't they? Because this myth has been created. You know, remember Greenspan and Bernanke and all these people? The maestro, that's what they used to call Greenspan. He was the maestro. Not too hot, not too cold. You know, this Bernanke character, when he left the Fed, as Federal Reserve Chairman, they brought that woman in. I can't even remember her name now. Janet Yellen. Now this Powell, this guy, this guy looks like a total fall guy, schlub. Another multimillionaire. This guy's a centimillionaire. Okay, so who do you think he's playing to? You don't think he has any conversations with any of his former colleagues? He's just sitting there with all of our best interests and the best interests of the 330 million people at large of the United States. I mean, gr grow up. So the point is, we have to see things for the way they are. We have to prepare for them. They're going to print whatever. I never thought I would see this. Is it going to be 10 trillion, 20 trillion, 40 trillion? Who knows? But they say, they say here, he says, that the Fed will act forcefully, proactively, and aggressively. Are they going to buy my old baseball card collection that you know tanked 90% in the 80s? Because it's for sale if they want it. I'll start going around to flea markets and buying up Beanie Babies. All right, let's shift gears a little bit. So this week, um, this is a 1,100 megawatt coal plant in Germany that just came online. Why am I showing you this? Well, Germany has been the focal point of the green movement, the, the movement to reduce CO2 emissions to zero. And in order to do this, the Germans created, I can't pronounce the word, they have this word for it in German, and it's like 50 letters long, but anyways, it basically means energy transition. And so what they said they were going to do is they were going to invest all this money in renewables, um, they were going to get rid of these coal plants, they were going, you know, they shut down their nuclear plants because after Fukushima, which I thought was absurd, it was a reactionary view, but that's what they did. And so things really haven't been working out like they thought because just wanting something doesn't mean it's going to happen. If something is contrary to reality, you know, reality doesn't care what you want. Reality is what it is, not what we want it to be. This is another example. Now, if you read articles about this, if you go look this plant up, you will see there's a lot of protests. It's still online. They brought it online. This thing doesn't even burn German coal. They import the coal from Russia and Colombia for this plant. That's, that's even a bigger kick in the nuts. But what's funny is that the energy transition isn't going the way people want it to go. And I think that Germany should be the lab retory. We should look at it because they were the ones that have been more, most forceful, have been on the leading edge, and have been on, the, uh, a, a, on this whole transition to a zero carbon future, which is virtually impossible. You cannot have a zero carbon economy unless, even if it's a stone age economy, you'd still be burning wood and cow dung to cook your food. So, you know, again, people really don't define their words. They don't define the meaning of words. They just say things. Most people react emotionally. The point I'm trying to make to you is this. I think this movement towards green is going to continue. It has inertia. There's a lot of rent seeking going on. There's a lot of people that make a lot of money. There's probably five, around the world, five, six hundred billion dollars a year being invested. It's not going to go away. Okay, so we have to look at it for what it is. But what I think is interesting is, is we're still bringing coal plants on in the place where coal plants are the, you know, verboten. They are a four-letter word. And, of course, my old friend Greta Thunberg weighed in on Twitter about this plant. Today is a shameful day for Europe as we open up a brand new coal power plant. We have signed up to lead the way to avoid a climate disaster. She's talking about Europe. And yet this, yet this, the signal we send to the rest of the world, how dare you indeed. So, like I said, 
there's a reason why, they, you know, if you read the press reports, they'll say, well, this is the last coal plant they're ever going to bring on. This is the last one, we promise. So it's been 10 years in the development and building of this plant. So maybe it's true. I don't know the future. I'm just pointing this out as a fact. But the problem is with the energy transition is it's kind of been a failure if you look at it from a perspective of its goals and then also the economic ramifications of it. So let's take a look at this. And this is an article I got from a hedge fund that I follow, which I'll, uh, it's called Sager Capital. I'll put a link to this presentation, but this is some of the things I pulled out of their presentation because they're pro-nuclear energy uh, investment. And what I've been advocating for is uh, what I've been telling a lot of people in the green movement or people that believe that CO2 is the bugaboo that it is, that's fine. I'm not going to argue that point, but the most efficient and best way to limit carbon uh, into the atmosphere is not uh, via renewables, it's nuclear power. And I think that it's the cleanest, cheapest, best form of power. And I think that we're seeing more and more people move to that. So, you know, I've actually been an advocate, you know, um, if people want to talk about a Green New Deal or a jobs program or just spend money we don't have to build things that are useful, I am of the view that the Trump administration or any government should come out, like in the United States, and say, um, you know, let's call it 50 and 10, 10 years. We're going to build 50 and 10, 20 and 10, 100 and 10, whatever. We're going to build 50 nuclear power plants in the next 10 years. Um, think of all the job, high-paid jobs, engineering jobs, skilled trades jobs, operator jobs. Um, they would be all highly paid. They would be highly skilled. You would get rid of the coal plants, a lot of the gas plants. Um, you could supplement. Obviously, you don't want to go 100%. I mean, the amount of schooling, the amount of growth around industry for manufacturing that would have to grow up. If you wanted to really have a policy and invest a trillion dollars in infrastructure, that's something you could do. Or even do 20 plants in 10 years. You could standardize the design and say, this is, this is the design that we're going to agree to in the United States for these type of reactors, 1,000 megawatt reactors, and we're going to build 10 of them in the next 10 years, and we're going to build 20 of them. And if you want to make it like the space... Uh, race in the 60s, you could say we're going to build 50 of these things in 10 years. And we're going to subsidize it, we're going to standardize it, and we're going to make it so that the parts are interchangeable and it's not everybody off doing their own thing, raising the costs. But I don't hear even any discussion about that. Or if you go to emerging markets, that's where all the growth is. So anyways, to go back to this slide to talk about the facts, you know, the price tag so far for the energy transition in Germany has been $600 billion. And for that, their carbon emissions are 860 million metric tons versus the stated 220 go 2020 goal of 750 metric million metric tons. So they've missed their goal by 110 million metric tons for carbon dioxide. And they're trying to be the leader on this. I would suggest... Instead of bringing this coal plant online, they shut it down and bring the nuke plants back online. But maybe they'll spend another $600 billion on renewables. Why you're putting solar plants in the north of Germany, it makes, I don't know, the irradiance is probably not that high there. Arizona desert, that's one thing. Southern California, that's North African Sahara desert, that's one thing. Northern Germany on the Baltic, probably not a good idea. So for their $600 billion, they have now 25% of the generation in Germany is now wind and solar. What that has gotten them is not meeting their targets for emissions, and they have the highest electric prices in Europe, 30.88 cents per kilowatt hour versus the European average of 20.5 cents. Uh, the grid, they have grid instability stemming from a greater proportion of intermittent energy in their electrical grid. However, they have been able to mitigate that and solve a lot of that by importing uh, baseload nuclear power from France. As you know, from our previous discussions, France had a big nuclear build-out in the 60s and 70s, and a large amount of their baseload is nuclear. So getting that baseload power imported into Germany has allowed them to overcome a lot of the grid stability. The problem here is, is that the consensus view in Europe 
where they're trying to be the leader on this is that they expect that upwards of 90% of European power generation could, I should put italics on that, could come from renewables by 2050. I don't know, anything's possible. Or maybe they'll just build more coal plants to stabilize their grid. Not sure about that. I can tell you one thing though, as emerging markets like China and India and these other places build low cost, reliable nuclear power, or use low-cost, reliable natural gas power, they will have a cost advantage for their manufacturing that Germany is giving away. Germany is a manufacturing powerhouse in Europe, and yet they're paying the highest um, power costs in Europe on average. That's probably not helpful to the manufacturing base in Germany. But I, I don't... You know, I haven't deep dove this. So basically, what if they would have, what if Germany, the question I ask here is, what if Germany would have spent $600 billion on nuclear energy instead of renewables? Where would their emissions really be now? I, I, I suggest they would probably have met their goal or far, far been in exceedance of it. You know, for the price of $600 billion, they could have bought, built 50 or 60 or more nuclear power plants and probably retired all their coal plants and did away with a majority of this uh, renewable situation. But they've chosen not to do that. And, you know, decisions and choices have consequences. So what I'm telling you is, is that I think, long story short, in a roundabout way, this is actually positive for nuclear energy. If the goal is, and it is in the West, is to get more green, ESG is a real thing, um, if the people in Western Europe, in the United States, Canada, Australia, want to move green, uh, they want to be the leaders on it, I think they're going to find, except for some smaller situations like we've seen, like, you know, in some of these countries, uh, they're going to have to move to, people are going to have to acknowledge that nuclear power is going to have to be part of the solution. Regardless of what Europe does or the United States does, it's still going to be a growth industry in the emerging markets because these people in the emerging markets understand facts and reality and they understand that it has to be part of the generation mix which it is and that's why it's growing that's the reason i wanted to point this out not to jump up on the grave and antagonize people out that are listening to this about green energy you know i work in green energy okay it is what it is what i'm trying to say is is that there's space for nuclear energy. There's space for, uh, if you want to go renewables, you can't, it's going to be very difficult to get to 100%. And if you really want to lower emissions, if carbon is really your thing, this experiment in Germany is not meeting the goals. So you can do one of two things. You can acknowledge that and course correct. Why don't they try to bring the nuke plants that they already have built back online for three to five years close the coal plants and see if they can meet their emissions targets. Or I guess they could try to spend another $600 billion and try to get their generation of renewables up to 50% and see if that does it. Those are two choices. I would suggest the former and not the latter, but I'm not the policymaker in Germany. Um, I'm going to put a link to this. I'm still listening to most of it. This was a um, Sashim Cove Partners old uh, friend of the show, Mike Alkin, uh, who we follow, who I think is probably one of the most uh, schooled up people on uh, uranium and the nuclear power uh, fuel cycle and investing in it, speculating in it, uh, was part of a roundtable presentation. And uh, I'll put a link to this. Uh, basically, I listened to most of it, uh, but I wanted to get this video out. I'm not going to deep dive it. I'm going to put a link to it. You can listen to it yourself. But basically, he's talking about prices, everything. And he goes through the inventories, the production, the cost that is necessary, the incentive price that is necessary to get people to commit capital to building new uranium mines. And the fact that you can't just build a new, you know, we're going to into a deficit situation with uranium, which we have talked about ad nauseum on this channel. But yet, when it becomes recognized, and it has not become recognized because this uranium market is so opaque, 
and the information is so uh, controlled by the consensus, which is basically one entity that may be not accurate, when it becomes well known where we really are vis-a-vis -vis supply and demand, and once the long-term contracting cycle starts with utilities and they start to discover that the amount of fuel that's available is not going to be sufficient, we are going to see the price rise very rapidly and I think overshoot what is necessary to stimulate new production to come online to fill the gap, the supply gap that has developed. And, you know, right now, you know, we're still waiting for a sediment change. We've had a, a nice, you know, steady increase in the spot price and people are frustrated, people are exhausted, people, in, but I'm not. I, this is how this, these things play out. I still do not see any difference in the thesis. I don't talk about it a lot anymore because there's really not much more to talk about. You just have to wait now. Supply is down and continues to get constricted. Demand continues to grow. And the, the fact that even when we do reach the incentive price, that it's going to take years to build or permit, build, and bring online new mines, I think is going to give us a bigger price increase and a longer duration bull market this time than we've seen in the past when it comes to uranium. But I'm going to put a link to this video. You can check it out. And um, you can... Uh, Leave some comments in the in the uh, comment section. Tell me what you think about it. Um, you can tell me what you think about it, uranium. I mean, I think you got to be careful. I've said this many times. I'm focusing on what's really investable in this nuclear uranium fuel uh, mining market. You got to be careful what you're buying. You're seeing. I'm seeing a lot of companies come to market trying to raise more cash again, right? to keep the lights on. I've talked about that also for the duration of this channel. There's very few companies that are investable in this market. There's only like two in my mind. That would be Kaz, Adam, Prom, and, and Cameco. If you want to speculate in the juniors, you really need to understand how quickly can they bring production on, um, what they're really trying to do. Are they just use, do they just marketing, you know, legacy mines that were part of the last bull market and they didn't get put in production then? You know, anybody can say, well, I have these uranium mines or Union Carbide uh, or Kaminko found these mines back in the 50s and 60s, but they may never actually become a mine. You have a resource, but it's not actually ever going to become a mine. You have to know that and understand that. And that company is just going to keep issuing shares, keep the lights on. You have to understand the difference between what's investable and what's not. And as I've said before, there's nothing wrong with buying uranium spot uranium, part of uranium participation if, if it's at a discount. But I know everybody wants that 10 to 1 and 100 to 1 shot, so people are not going to be dissuaded. But I think this would be excellent because Mike probably has mo more information. He talks to everybody. He's really letting a lot of good information out on this video, so I'll put a link to it and you can check it out. All right, that's, uh, that's it for this week, guys. I uh, appreciate the uh, support. I think we cracked 4,000 uh, listeners now. Please, if you want to help me out, if you, you, know, you enjoy the content, uh, I'm very provocative, I know. Uh, some people like the content, some people don't. This is life. I'm not here to please everybody. Um, I've been in politics before. Half the people are not going to like what you say regardless of what you say. So that's, that's just how it is. Um, some people like it, some people don't, some people agree with some of the things I say, some people don't agree. We all have our opinions, we all have our views. Hit me up in the comment section, I'm happy to have that dialogue. If you are interested in understanding how I'm transforming these types of discussions and thought process into actionable uh, stock picks or investable or investing uh, vehicles or speculation vehicles, you can take a subscription to the Actionable Intelligence Alert newsletter, of which I will put a link in the comment section. Or you can also uh, go to my Patreon, which I'll put a link. And if you um, agree to a $5 uh, subscription, which you can cancel any time, I will give you the current months. And this is very important because people, I don't s seem to be able to communicate this. If you agree to support the Patreon for $5 a month, 
I will give you the current months or recent months, because sometimes we don't have a new pick, but the most recent uh, pick of the Actionable Intelligence Alert newsletter uh, stock pick. That's not an ongoing thing. You don't just, you know, $5 a month and you get the pick every month. That's not how it works. It's a one-time deal. But some people do like to support me on Patreon. Uh, some people appreciate this. If you just like listening to these videos and uh, you, you want to help me out, consider subscribing. And uh, that helps it out. Uh, comments, f sharing the videos, that helps the algorithm. Uh, and we attract more and new viewers. And that is helpful to me also. Okay, guys, appreciate it. We'll talk to you next week.